Thank you. Thank you. That's Maddie Bivens. Maddie Bivens, granddaughter of Ann and Ken McDonald, visiting here from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We're so glad to see her and her parents here today. What a, what a joy to see you all today. Now we're going to join in our song of celebration. Every time I feel the spirit. Every time I... Please stand, y'all. the mountain my Lord spoke out his mouth came far and smoke all around me looked so shine ask my Lord if all was mine every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart I will pray Be seated. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin and also on the screens. A mighty wind has blown and tongues of fire. The presence of the Spirit is with us. The presence of the Spirit moves and gathers us into community. Let us marvel at God's power. I'm so glad to see each one of you here today. Thank you for being a part of our worship experience today. And I want you to welcome, he's just going to stand up in the back, Jerry and Jerry Beth, our new pastor is coming in and his wife. So, <clears throat> um, Silas, Silas, turn your camera down. Okay. Y'all keep standing and everything. I'll make sure the people at home can see you, Jerry and Jerry Beth. And Jerry and Jerry Beth, um, tell you what, can you, can you give him a mic real quick to tell us? Uh, uh, well, he can say, he can, he's got a preacher voice. Tell us who you brought with you. Sure. Uh, this is my mother, Melba Jones. Okay. And from Louisville, Texas. Yes. All right. We are so delighted to have you all here, Jackson Pace. It's so good. Y'all flying away. So good to have you all here. <clears throat> well, we want you all to stick around for a church family photo on the front porch right after worship. I want to be able to have the time to hand off the red baton to Pastor Jerry. This with some photos, photographs on that. So we'll, we'll have, we want the whole church family some afterwards. Come on out there. Now, I want to introduce... Ray Dunlap, our lay leader, who has the rest of our announcements. Good morning. So as Pete said, uh, please stick around for a few minutes after worship as professional photographer Jim Herndon gathers us for a church family photo. And uh, we'll have free copies of it next week for everybody. But we need you in it uh, today, so please stick around. Also, if you'll come back this afternoon, we invite uh, College Mound United Methodist Church Pastor Bob Williams and his wife, organist Susan Williams, and their congregation to join with ours as a Pentecostal organ concert and Acts 2 readings. Uh, let's celebrate the incoming of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the birthday of the church, and that's today at 4 o'clock right here in our sanctuary with our beautiful and historic organ. This coming Thursday, June 1st at 6 p.m. in Fellowship Hall, we'll be having a Build Your Own Ice Cream Sunday with a Holy Land devotional focused on Jesus' ministry on the Sea of Galilee and what we can expect to experience on our upcoming trip in May of 2024. Uh, if you're interested in going with us or you just want to enjoy some ice cream and learn about the Holy Land, 
uh, we would love for you to join us again 6 p.m. this Thursday, June 1st in Fellowship Hall. Next Sunday, June 4th, we're planning a church-wide picnic and devotional at Wesley Killian's place. Thanks to a generous grant from SMU Perkins School of Theology's Testimony HQ program, the church will provide the brisket catered with all of the fixings. We just need a few folks to bring a few desserts, some volunteers to help with parking. And again, that's next Sunday, June 4th at Wesley's on Poetry Road. It's about a mile past the high school and hope to see you there. The Sunday after that, June 11th, it will be Pete and Daria's last Sunday uh, with us and uh, you know, kind of, kind of sad to think about, uh, about that, but there is a lunch planned afterwards because you can't have a pastor change without food, and so uh, <clears throat> lunch is planned, so please, uh, please make plans and let's, uh, let's give uh, Pete and Daria a, a big send-off, and then July 2nd, we can welcome Jerry and Jerry Beth uh, as we make the switch official. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Please register your attendance uh, online. Share anything that you would like for staff to know, prayer concerns, or any questions that you have. Uh, you can go to fumcterrell.org and scroll down on the left-hand side. Thank you for your financial support for the ministries of our church. Uh, there are three ways to give. By placing your gifts in the wooden box at the exits, by dropping off or mailing your check to 503 West College Street, Terrell, Texas, or by going online to type in the amount you want to give in the name of our church, FUMC Terrell, or go to the website, FUMCTerrell.org, and click on the big red donate button. And for those who have been giving online, thank you. The service changed. Uh, we changed providers this week, and so you should have received an email. And please contact Amber in the church office and she can walk you through switching over to the new system. As we prepare our hearts and worship this Pentecost service, please hear this reading from Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be the tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I invite you all to stand and join our next hymn this morning, number 422, Jesus Thine All Victorious Love. Mm -hmm. Jesus, thine all victorious love shed in my heart abroad. Then shall my feet no longer root, rooted and fixed in God. Oh, that in me the sacred fire might now begin to glow. Burn out the cross of day's desire and make the mountains flow. Oh, that it now from heaven might fall and all my sins consume. Come, Holy Ghost, for thee I call, Spirit of burning, come. Refining fire go through my heart, illuminate my soul. Scatter my life through every part and sanctify the whole. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 45 verses 1 through 5 and verses 14 and 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the, Egypt 
Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it, and Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Verses 15, I mean 14 and 15. Then he fell upon his brother's Benjamin neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept among them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Thank you, Ray. Now I'd like to ask Jerry and Jerry Beth, if y'all could bring your grandchildren down and other young people in the audience that want to come on down. We wanted to. See what you brought me. Wow. McKin you're McKinley, right? McKinley. M McKinsley. McKinsley and Kinley. Yeah, come on in here. It's good to see you guys. Yeah. Jerry, Pastor Jerry and Jerry Beth. Tell me the names of your grandchildren again. Jackson. Jackson. Okay. Paisley. Paisley. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. Do, do, okay. But yeah. So, so uh, we're delighted to see you all here. Look what McKinsley brought me. She brought me something that her daddy wears, which is so you, when you wore this, Katie wore this. Okay, wow, that's right. Katie was a firefighter. That's right. Well, fantastic. And yeah, so it's great. Thank you very much, Katie, for serving it with with uh, as as a firefighter. I brought some some puppets here today. Do you know what this one is right here? That's a firefighter. Can you put that on your hand? And how about how about down there? Could one of you you would put that on your hand? There, Silas. And how about Jackson? You want to put this on your hand? It's a puppet. Can you put that on your hand? Yeah. Yeah, just put your hand in there. There you go. So hold it up so everybody sees at home. They can see what you're talking about. So th this, is, this is different roles people have. These are all people that, that help us, right? So we have what? We have a firefighter here, and we have a police officer here, and we have what? A doctor person here, a me medical person. You hold that up. So they're, they're all people who help us, and sometimes they help us carry a load. In other words, a heavy load on what we're dealing with. And so firefighters especially carry a heavy load. Well, I have a friend of mine who is a firefighter, retired firefighter. His name's David Lindsay. Many of y'all may know his family, the Lindsay family. Well, David Lindsay wants to help the families of firefighters, uh, who, who, firefighters who have lost their lives in service to our country and our community. And so he's doing something called Carry the Load tomorrow. And so tomorrow from, on Memorial Day, not only for firefighters, but also for police officers who fall in the line of duty, and also for, um, for veterans or people who've served us, they're going to have a, a thing in Dallas. It's going to be a rally and kind of a final part of a walk. They've been walking since the West Coast. They came from like Washington State and he's been walking all the way or riding his bikes. Anyway, they're, they're set, doing this thing called Carry the Load and it'll be tomorrow. So that'll be very special because we want to remember that people carry the load for us. We want to be there to carry the load for them and to do some things that, that make, make their life a lot better. So we, so we think about our first responders, our firefighters, our police officers, our medical professionals, and uh, Jerry Best, a medical professional too. We're glad, glad to have her work she does. And so some great things that, that happen, and also our veterans, especially as we remember those who've fallen on this day, Memorial Day. So we're thankful. Let's, let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, thank you for the good folks who've been helping so much to carry our loads. Help us to carry the load for someone else. It's in your name I pray. Amen. And thank you very much for bringing your, your mom's helmet. How, what a blessing and everything like that. You want to take it back? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Good to see you here. Thanks. Good to bless you. It's now time for our, our pastoral prayer. If you would take a look at the back of your bulletin. There's some prayer concerns that have been listed there. And I want to update you on a couple of new ones. One is, we've got some news in the back. Ted and Charlotte, you'll have a new great-grandbaby? All right, congratulations. 
So tell me the statistics. Okay, we know it's, it's a new great-granddaughter named Chloe, born when? This morning? This morning. Pentecost baby. All right. <laughs> Six pounds and two ounces. Well, that's great. And the daughter of, of Brooke and Corey. And uh, wow, and so your great, your great granddaughter. Well, congratulations. That's great news. Uh, also, Tom and Rose Snow, they, they, they might not have, could have stayed. They, they had to go. They've got a grandson celebrating Eagle Scout, getting his Eagle Scout presented on today. He's being awarded. His name is Cade Wesson. Cade Wesson's Brad's son. So congratulations to Tom and Rose Snow on their grandson, Cade, earning Eagle. Um, we want to be in prayer for those that you see listed on here uh, we have, we have uh, David and Ann Johnson and family on the loss of David's mom and longtime church member Jimmy Johnson. We had her service last Thursday at Restland. And also there was a Wills Point family that lost an eight-year-old son. I mentioned this to you last week and continue to pray for that family, the family of uh, Thomas Berry and a collision that they had there. Uh, Tom and Julie Ponder probably watching us from home. Pray for them to feel better soon. Uh, pray for Derry and I to get better. We've been kind of Giving each other, well, I should say, I gave her whatever it is that I had, and now she's got it. And I think I, I think I'm okay, but she's still coughing a little bit. I'm still coughing, but <coughs> excuse me. But um, pray for us to get through these things during these times. I know there are other prayer concerns, but I just wanted to bring those to your your attention and uh, make sure you, you guys knew what was going on to be in prayer. So let's turn to God now. Lord, I thank you for your presence in this room. I thank you for the the spirit that's blowing through this room, that Holy Spirit, and you fill us with the joy of the Lord. And I just pray like I pray right now, Lord, for the transition that we're having in pastors with Pastor Jerry coming in. And I, I look forward to him and his family moving into this community, being part of this, this wonderful place. I pray that you watch over them. Be with Derry and I as we transition to Sulphur Springs and be with our congregation there as well as this congregation here as well as Jerry's congregation in Van Alstine. And may we, uh, may we continue to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Lord, you taught us a prayer to pray on the night before you died. Let's, let's pray that prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, choir. Beautiful, beautiful. Our gospel reading today is John chapter 15, about I am the vine and the branches. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So my younger brother, John, who is, uh, lives, lives in an apartment complex called The Village in uh, East Dallas. Now, some of you may have heard of The Village. It's been around for a long time. It's, it's long been known as a place where there's lots of young, energetic people running around, riding their bicycles, playing golf, all, all kinds of things. It's a very large apartment complex uh, in East Dallas. So I was, I was driving over there to check on him because he's had some health challenges and we were getting him, getting him better. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, anyway, so as I was going by there, I saw, I know this is the first weekend of summer, unofficially, Memorial Day weekend, you know. But I saw, I saw one, two, three, four different young men out running or walking without any shirts on. I mean, they're just running with, you know, no shirt on, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not be a prude or anything. I think I'm just kind of jealous. <laughs> because, you know, these guys are running around looking all young and fit and tan and just really just going like this, you know, with no shirts on. And I go, I, and I do run around in Terrell. And I ride my bicycle too, things like that. And I go, if I was running around in Terrell with no shirt on or a bicycle, Terrell 911 would be getting some phone calls. <laughs> I'm not sure if it be for criminal indecency or care flight. One of the two, you know. <laughs> but somebody will be calling and say, what's he doing out there without a shirt on? So, but I, but I, I did, I did uh, think these, these people are young, they're fit, kind of tan, you know, running, jogging. 
reminds me that each one of us comes in a body. And Christ came in a body. We, we are ones who, who live in, inside the skin that we have, the skin we have. And there's a variety of sizes. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a variety of sizes. Some are tall, some are short, some are fat, some are skinny, some are different colored skin. There, there's, there's a lot of different sizes and shapes. <coughs> Excuse me. But there's also a lot of different ages. And um, I'm sorry. There's a lot of different ages of people. There's different, different color skin. There's different nationalities. You might say this kind of wraps, is part of what we call our physicality. The physicality of who we are. You know, we, we have um, something about just, just who we are is our, our physical nature. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm having a harder time now than I was earlier. But <coughs> so so uh, this will be a short sermon. So we'll say that. <laughs> but a, a little bit of a lesson, though. <coughs> I want us to think about who we are because so much emphasis is on the physical. How we look, what we have, even what we do for a living where we live, you know, things that we have, physical nat- our physical nature is made up by that. But that's not all of who we are. That's the physical. <clears throat> but there's, there is much more than just the physical. And I think Joseph, in the story that Ray read, was just starting to get that. He was starting to understand that there was more to life than the physical. Because here was a man, young man, probably mid-30s, amazingly successful. Probably very good-looking from what we know in the Bible. Very good-looking young man who occupied a body that was not only strong and good-looking, but also intelligent. <coughs> very intelligent. And he could... Uh, what's that? Oh, no, it's okay. I'm okay. He, he was very, very intelligent. And he, could, uh, he, could, he, could, he was put in a high position. And his, the position he was put in was one where he was basically the right-hand man to the Pharaoh. He was in charge of a major food distribution program. And it was, <coughs> excuse me, leading up to the famine. I'm sorry. <coughs> it had been a, a time of, um, a time of um, a famine that they'd had. And there had been a, a, a really... A difficult situation worldwide. And his wisdom had helped to basically prepare them for the famine. And then, not only then, but by this time, they were actually selling grain to foreign countries. People were coming to them. They had become basically a, a, a very powerful country with Joseph helping to lead the way. You may say, from a physical standpoint, he was at the top of his game. He was one people would maybe envy and say, I wish I could be like Joseph. That's, a, that's amazing. But there was more to Joseph than just the physicality. There's more to you than just your physical physicality of what you have. For instance, there was a psychological side of Joseph. When you think about his life, it had not been just all roses. At this stage of his life, he had been through so much. First of all, he was born into a family that had 12 sons, but four mamas. Think about that. Let that soak in. Twelve sons, but four mamas. It was built-in division already taking place. There was such built-in division and such rivalry. There was such jealousy. In fact, when they saw that their daddy kind of favored Joseph, who was next to the youngest, the boys, some of them, wanted to kill him. And then they decide rather than kill him, they'll just put him in this cistern and sell him into slavery to a traveling band of Midianites. I mean, there's that much hatred and, and challenge. Well, so then it gets kind of worse from there because Joseph goes off with the Midianites to Egypt. He's sold to Potiphar to be, to be one of his slaves. And then as he's rising up and doing a good job for Potiphar, what happens? Well, he's a good-looking guy, and Potiphar's wife sees him and 
approaches him and tries to seduce him. When he refuses to be seduced, what happens? <coughs> he is accused of sexual assault against her and put in jail. Even in jail, he's asked to, to uh, interpret dreams for these two co fellow prisoners. One of them he interprets a dream for, and it comes true, and that person is released the next day. The other person interprets a dream for, and that person is executed. It's like he has a skill of being able to do that, but he still was left abandoned in the, uh, in the jail. Later on, he's, he's, you might say, rises to power, but he's had what you might call a lot of post-traumatic stress. He's been through a lot psychologically. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you have been through a lot psychologically. Because each one of us has a psychological side. In other words, it's, a, it's an area of us where we're thinking, what, is, what am I telling myself? What do, I, what do I tell myself who I am? All the physicality, all the outside stuff may be one thing, but there's inside, there's how he sees himself, how you see yourself, how I see myself. There's more to us than just the physical. There's the psychological. There's also the social. And when you think about it, this, this young man, Joseph, while he might have made plenty of new friends with the powerful position that he had, deep down, he was cut off, cut off from his family, those 11 brothers. Maybe he didn't really care for all 11 of them, but at, at least one of them he really loved. One was from his mom and his dad. Benjamin was a close friend. And so he was separated cut off from them, cut off from his own father even. And in the days before Facebook or social media, he had no idea if his dad was even still alive. So you've got a physical, a psychological, and a social. And then Jesus enters the picture. And Jesus comes with the idea that we need much more of a spiritual side. And in this last, this last, uh, last supper, at this time that he's there together with them. He's making it clear that we need to be connected, not only to one another, but to Christ and Christ's self. And so what I want to point out to you is what, what I believe is, is this box that we live in. Psychologists call this what they call existential. In other words, having to do with your existence. Everybody from somebody that's that's living in a, in, a, in a slum in India, to on the Amazon River where maybe Walt Davis has taken water filters to him, to somebody living in a, in a palace in, in, in Europe, to somebody living in the farmland in the middle of Nebraska, or anywhere else. There, each one of us has these four walls, you might say, a physical, a psychological, a spiritual, and a social. Spiritual even for those who really reject faith, or at least don't pay attention to it. We all experience these. What I want to point out is that Christ calls us, especially to stay plugged in, Christ connects us. Through the cross. By that connection, we are one with God, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world. The, the cross connects us. The cross helps us to define who we are, to connect us with our physical self, of who we are, our psychological self, our social self, and our spiritual self. He makes, it, he makes, us, he makes us one in understanding of these things. And so he said on the night before he died, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches, remain in me and you will bear much fruit. Being a Christian is a team sport. I believe it's all connected and that Jesus on the cross connected us as one. And on Pentecost, the disciples started to get that. Fifty days after the resurrection, they started to get that. They started to get that the people were divided by language, divided by custom, divided by different views of religion, and they were brought together by the powerful wind of the Holy Spirit. 
God was uniting them and opening their eyes and their hearts and their ears to each other. God has been calling us to do that all along. And so I want to put you back in the Genesis story and give you a feeling for what it was like at this stage. First of all, it's interesting that Genesis chapter 37 through 50 is all about this Joseph story. In chapter 45 is what you see acted out here. It's what you see is by, by a lot of back and forth between the brothers asking for grain and uh, Joseph trying to not let them know who he is. But finally, at some point in the part that Ray was reading, said, he said I, he could no longer control himself. The emotion was so strong. You might say the social, psychological emotion was so strong that he wanted so much to be back with these brothers that finally he tells everybody to leave the room, all, this, all the attendants to leave the room. And he speaks to them and he says, he says, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? He just has to know. And they are just stunned. If you can imagine how sweaty and nervous they probably were in the Egyptian heat to be there. They're, they're seeking food and they've been accused literally of stealing silver from, these, from, from the Egyptians. And here they are, they're just, they're, they've had one of their brothers even put in jail, has been put in jail uh, as kind of a, um, you might say not a hostage, but just kind of li liability to kind of, kind of keep them there. And uh, security, you might say. And now they're, they're there with this powerful fi figure, this person who presents all the physicality of being the man in charge. And he's telling them, you know, hey, I'm Joseph. They go, uh-oh. This is the one we put in the cistern. This is the one who some of us thought about killing. This is the one we sold into slavery. This is the one we told our dad that he must have been eaten by wild animals. And here's his coat of many colors. This is that one, and he's now in charge. And they, you, know, you should imagine, I would just call it a, a, you know, a tense, tense moment of sweat pouring out. And here, these men together see this Joseph Come up and give Benjamin a big old hug. And then he hugs each one of them. And there's just, you just imagine the, the sight of this reunion taking place among people who had been so divided. And one of the first things he says is, guys, I'm going to get you some new clothes. Because <laughs> you can just imagine what things people smelled like. Shepherds out there that have been there. So he gets him some new clothes. He takes good care of him. He says, you guys come and bring, your dad, bring our dad back to this land. It's a great sense of reunion. And today, when we live in such a divided world, as the world is divided over everything and so many different things, I wonder if we need some more of those Joseph moments. When he realizes who he is, and they realize who they are. And that connection is more of an identity of who we all are in Christ. Physically, psychologically, socially, and spiritually. We realize that identity that we have in Christ. And that changes everything. And the world, instead of being so divided, starts to be more united. You know, in our own church... United Methodist Church, the last 12 months have posed bitter divisiveness that's led to disaffiliations and some strong words by people on both sides about so many things. It's sad to see that in the kingdom that's taken place. I truly believe that those churches who have disaffiliated, and there's about 4,000 of the 30,000 in the United Methodist Church in our country that have disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church. And I truly believe that the folks who did that did it as a matter of conscience, a matter of their heart, that chose to leave, that they just couldn't stay. I want to say that as a matter of conscience, I've chosen to stay. I've chosen to stay United Methodist because I believe there are many things we can accomplish together. But I also, I grieve with these brothers and sisters of mine who have moved on I don't hold anything against them. I love them. And so today, with our Pentecost, the birthday of the church, 
I've reached out and I've invited three churches who have moved on and left our denomination, one in Forney, one in Wills Point, one in Maybank. I've also invited many other denominations to come today to this gathering that we have because, folks, there's more that, there's more that connects us than divides us. We need to be able to see the good and, and, and get connected. And the response I've received has been very positive from all the churches that have said, yes, we will, we will announce this today at our church. We will encourage people to come. So I'll encourage you to come because tonight at 4 o'clock or this afternoon at 4 o'clock, this is, this is the birthday of the church, not First United Methodist Church, not the Terrell Church. It's the birthday of the church with the capital C. This is the day of Pentecost. And it's a day that we, as those who are part of the kingdom of Christ, need to learn that we are one and there is more that connects us than divides us. We need to find pathways for being the church. Like that song the kids say, I am the church, you're the church. We are the church together. All the God's children all around the world, we are the church together. So on the night before he died, Jesus took his disciples aside. He said, guys, we need to talk. It's important for you to stay in me, in this vine, because I am the vine and you are the branches. It's important that you stay connected, not just to me, but to each other. I need you to do this. Get this right. We are connected. Jesus is challenging you. He's challenging me not to be cut off from our brothers and sisters, but to find ways to stay plugged in, in this body, in the United Methodist Church, in the Church of God throughout the world, in all the denominations, in our society. Find ways to stay plugged in to God. And find ways to stay plugged in to each other. There is kingdom work to be done. And we have a lot that we can do. I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in his presence on holy We stand in his presence on holy ground. We're prepared to sing on eagle's wings. I want to just encourage anyone who needs prayer time to come on down and pray. But I got to tell you, as soon as the song's over, we're on the front porch, okay? So, so I need you to make a pathway out there as safely as we can to try to connect us out there. And we've got Jim out there, Jim Herndon, Aaron's, Aaron's husband, setting up for the, uh, the camera. So we want to be out of the shadows to be out from the front porch, out either on the steps or down on the front, out front. So we want to be there together as we, uh, as we prepare for our Pentecost time. Hear this word of, of benediction as we prepare to go. Jesus challenges us to put our past divisions behind us. Don't cut yourself off from the vine that is the kingdom of God. Work to stay plugged in to Christ and each other. And God will raise you up on eagles' wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of God's hand.